and you're visiting, really glad you're here. My name's Tyler, I'm one of the pastors here. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter five. Gospel of Matthew chapter five. We're continuing on the Sermon on the Mount. So the last nine weeks, what we did is we went through the, the Beatitudes, the first um, nine, or actually nine uh, Beatitudes, 12 verses where Jesus is beginning to open up for us, here are the people that are in the kingdom of God. Now, one of the things that's really important for you to know, to just to remember, I'm not gonna go over all the Beatitudes, but if you missed any of those, go check those out online. It's really important, because that's the foundation of the Sermon on the Mount. If you, if you really wanna know what Jesus has to say, don't skip over the first thing he has to say, right? But in the Beatitudes, what I hope you just realized is God is not after a mediocre life for you. He's not after a mediocre joy and just decent treasures and rewards for you. He's actually after joy for you and to fill your life up to the full. He's after rewards for you. So don't, don't think, if you think Christianity is kind of this muted sort of joy and love and kind of bland experience, you don't know the kingdom of God quite yet. It's the whole point of the Beatitudes is Jesus is saying, no, 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 you wanted the kingdom of God to get filled up. That's what I'm about to do. So he walks through all of that, that's where, we, where we've been, and now he's transitioning from the Beatitudes into all these various sections of teachings where Jesus is gonna begin to unpack for us what are the ethics of his kingdom? How, how does it work? Like he's gonna honestly apply those Beatitudes into, into situations and say, what do people who look like this do in this situation? What's God's calling on their life? So here's the very first thing he hits in Matthew 5, 13. This is the, his vision of his kingdom. Here's what Jesus says. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And then he gives this warning. But if you lose your saltiness, he's really saying, what good are you? Now, here's the kind of big question Jesus is really addressing. How does his kingdom, the kingdom he's building, how does that kingdom relate to the world, right? How, how does his kingdom, and for our purposes, how does the church, the church, the, this church, we are an expression of the kingdom of God, how does the church relate to other kingdoms in the world that don't submit to or align with God's kingdom? He's addressing this question, how are we to relate to a world that is not following Jesus the way that we are? Now here's what's fascinating, is since Jesus founded Christianity, since his, his people began to follow him from the very first followers of Jesus, this has been a constant question for the church. What does it mean for us to be in the world, but not of the world? What does it mean for us to live in the world and yet not, and still be distinct from the world? What does that mean, what does it look like? And here's the question that a lot of people have to ask. Should the church always be the leader of the world or should the church merely serve from a distance? Should, should the church try to lead the world proactively or should we withdraw and be able to serve from a distance? Now, your answer to that question has to do with your own personal experience. It has to do with your view of the history of the church because for so many of you in this room, though you've had your challenges with the church, I would imagine that one of the reasons you're here is because the church, in some form or fashion, has blessed your life immensely. I would imagine, in some form or fashion, the church has blessed your life immensely. The reason you are a Christian is probably because some other Christian or some church loved you and hung out with you and taught you the scriptures in such a way. Maybe it was this church, maybe it was, it was another one. And, and you know the church isn't perfect, but your ex personal experience has been fairly positive. You've seen bad things, and yet your experience has been, for the most part, something that has blessed your life. So, you, so there's some of you in the room, when you think of the church, you don't immediately have negative connotations, right? So you think about the church's role in the world and that's gonna affect the way you answer the question. For others of you, you are striving to believe the best, but if you're really honest, it's been really difficult to trust the church. It's been really difficult to believe the church should have influence. So maybe you're compelled, uh, compelled by Jesus, maybe something about just the faith that Christianity brings, but there's probably something about the church and your experiences of it that makes you go, I don't know if I wanna be a Christian if it means aligning with these people. Have you had that experience in the last couple years? 
where you think, if for me to be a Christian means aligning with this person who's also a Christian or this entity that's called a church, if I have to believe what they believe and be associated with them in this particular area or this particular regard or this political issue, whatever it may be, then maybe I don't want to be a Christian. Because, or maybe your personal experience with the church or you've seen real brokenness and real dysfunction and real error. You can actually be a Christian and struggle to believe that the church should have a real leadership role in the world. You really can. You can be a Christian and look at the church and go, I don't know if we should really be the ones to help them sort through these problems. We can't get through our own problems. Like how are we gonna help them with their business when we have our own issues going on internally? And right now, everyone's experience, if you're a Christian in this room, all of our experience of our country right now, our culture right now, we experience it so differently. It is so fascinating to me how someone who I know is a believer, we can watch the same thing happening in the world and have two totally different responses. Right, they, they see something happen in the world, they're like, amen, that's right. I'm like, are you for real right now? And then I see something, I'm like, that's so good. And they think, wait, you really think that that's a good thing or a bad thing? And it's fascinating because it depends on your view of the church in the world. And what's happening in our culture is for the most part, people are just growing in their indifference towards the church. What, what you see happening is, it's not that, now there are some pockets of this that are very antagonistic towards the church, but for the most part, we're, we're, not, we're not at a place yet where everyone hates the church. That's, that's not where we're at. Maybe we'll get there in a couple of years or decades, but right now we're not. Right now where we are is for the most part, people just don't care what we have to say. They just don't. For the most part, the world views the church as just another religious entity that has some compelling ideas about it. Some things about Christianity that are good and about Buddhism that are good and Islam that are good and just one of another group of people who believe in something. But nothing about us is really, for, honestly, for the most part, intriguing to the world. That's why there's, there's be all these kind of internal sort of squabbles going on, like the larger sort of evangelical church, and you ask your coworker, like, hey, what do you think about this thing? They're like, I've never heard of any of those people you've just mentioned. Like, who is Matt Chandler? You're like, how do you not know who Matt Chandler is? Right, like you have this, you all of a sudden you realize, oh, there's a world where they don't really care what we're doing or what's going on. Because what's happening is a growing indifference. What you see growing in kind of uh, sociological studies is there's not actually, what you think it's a growth in atheism, it's not. What you see growing in the Pew research polls where people put in spirituality, they, they just put none. They don't associate with any religion. They're, just, they're still maybe spiritual people. They just don't associate with any sort of organized form of religion. Why? Growing indifference. I don't hate it. I don't love it. I just kind of want to live my life and do what I do. So for some Christians, when they see us kind of getting pushed to the sidelines of the world, it's very unnerving because they have a triumphant view of the church. So if you're here and just the way things are going in our culture kind of scares you, it's probably because you have a triumphant view of the church. You have this kind of notion that if the church were being faithful, we would always be a leader in the culture, right? You read this verse that Jesus just said, it says we are the salt of the earth. You look at history of our country or even larger things, you see the church serving in ways no one else was. You can look at, there's historical examples of the church serving in areas no one else wanted to and blessing the world in ways no one else wanted to. And so people who have this triumphant view of the church really have this notion as if, if we were really being faithful, we'd always be out in front, right? So that's why when we're not out in front and we're being ignored, it makes you kind of unnerved, have some heartburn. Now the other view, uh, others of us, why is it when you see, if you're a Christian, when you see the culture ignoring us, maybe even rejecting us, it doesn't cause you much heartburn, right? You see someone rejecting Christianity and nothing about you goes, Get the canned food, it's over. Like nothing about you feels that way. You got some bunkers, sorry if I hit some sensitive topics there. <laughs> Jeez, lighten up five. Um, just a bunker joke, take it easy. Um, that's not, I don't have bunker joke in my notes. Uh, it's totally ad lib. So, but for others of us, why is it when you see that nothing in you is phased? Probably because, probably because we are kind of used to having, we kind of view the church as probably, if it's faithful, it's going to be marginalized and probably you have more of a fatalistic view of the church. 
where you probably think, because on your own personal experience, we're never going to be that anyway. And even when we were that, we probably were being corrupt about it. Like, and and I, I know for me, like when, when I became a Christian, and I went to my, the university that I went to, nothing about me thought, oh, being a Christian makes you super cool, right? Like nothing about my experience was like, oh, everyone who's awesome is a Christian. Like that's not my experience. My experience was every person I met in college when I was a freshman, not one person that I met actually was a follower of Christ. I just had, I didn't meet any. And, I, and so in my mind, my expectation was, oh, to be a Christian means you're gonna be kind of marginalized. You're, you're not gonna have this spot in the center of, of leadership and influence all the time because not everybody believes what we believe. So for me, when I, my, my disposition, honestly, when I see things going on that look like people are rejecting Christianity, I tend to not get that unnerved by it. But then, listen, I read verses like this where Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, and I begin to wonder, should I be more upset? Like, it, I mean, I think sometimes we kind of view the person as being, who, whoever's the most laid back is the most trusting of God. That's not true. Trusting God may, should cause you sometimes to actually get upset. You see evil in the world and you think it shouldn't be that way. And when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, he's clearly saying you have a special role to play, isn't he? Does anyone think that Jesus meant like, hey, just take it easy and chill when he said that? No. And so Jesus comes to us and he helps both sides. If you're more of a triumphalist or you're a fatalist, he helps both sides. Because here's the thing, Jesus is not concerned with the amount of authority that the church has in any given culture. It's really important you hear that. Jesus is not overly concerned with the amount of authority the church has in any given culture and society. He's concerned in our role in blessing that society no matter how much authority we have. You see what he's doing there? Here he's making it about the function of playing the role of being salt, not the position you hold in that culture. So he comes to us and he says to those who think we should be the leaders of the earth or to those who think the church is, is inconsequential to the earth, he says, you're both wrong. You should be the salt of the earth. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Those who belong to the kingdom of God those who are followers of Jesus, you are salt of the earth. Now, some of this, the weight of this metaphor is lost on us it's just, just a little bit because, well, honestly, advances in technology. They didn't have a refrigerator back then, right? So I doubt any of you took a big slab of beef today and just salting it to make sure it was cured right. Maybe you were, there are refrigerators, you should buy one, right? They're, they're made to store food, right? But on the other side of this, the, the, the metaphor is highlighted because we're a foodie city. And so we can understand that if something is not seasoned, it's gonna be less flavorful, right? And those are the two things that when Jesus says salt of the earth, that's the metaphor he has in mind. Salt was used to preserve food from decaying and salt was used to season food to bring out flavors. So really simply, salt was used to preserve good and to bring out what is good. To preserve good and to bring out what is good. And he looks at his people and he says, that's what you are. Not individually, but as a people. You are that to the earth. And what is fascinating, he's saying you, you, Texas, y'all, right? That's what he means, y'all. He's Texan, I'm sure. Y'all, I'm just kidding, he's not Texan. Let me just go and say that. Um, you all, let's be, be more clear, are those who possess the Beatitudes, not those who possess power. It's really critical you understand that. Oftentimes when we think about in a society, who are the ones that bear the responsibility of preserving what is good, protecting what is good, and bringing out what is good? We tend to think it's those who have power. It's politicians or business leaders or celebrities or so on. Those who've been given authority and governance and fame, they're the ones who bear the special weight of doing good things in the world. We tend to want to, the church is always trying to shirk her responsibility of being salt to the earth. So we'll happily trust in politicians or people with finances or celebrities and think they're the ones, this kind of trickle down sort of influence. If they could actually get it, then we'll all be fine. But that's not what Jesus says. 
He's saying you to those who possess the Beatitudes. See, even if they have a power and authority, and listen, God has given all those in authority, all those who have fame, all those who have money, God's the one who's given that to them. He's given it to them so they'd bless the world. But until they possess Beatitudes, and still they have those ideas of being poor in spirit, they won't do it in the way that God wants. He's saying it's those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are peacemakers, those who are blessed by God to be in his kingdom, those are the ones who are called to be salt of the earth. So while this will include people in power who follow Jesus, this is the title and calling of the people of God. If you're a Christian, this is a title and calling given to you, to us. So we, we should be the ones who protect what is good from what is evil. We are the ones who should stand against what is evil. We're the ones who should be proactive in that. Now the applications of this are numerous. Impossible for me to enumerate here and just in one sermon. Right, there's evils around you that are overt. There's evils around you that are subtle. And when you see evil in the world, if you're a Christian, you should feel a special responsibility about standing against that evil in the world. That's what Jesus is saying. Something is decaying, and that's what's fascinating. Jesus assumes the world is decaying. You should assume the special responsibility that God has given to us. We can't delegate the weight to those who haven't seen and tasted what the kingdom of God is like. We can't merely talk about it or post about it, though awareness and raising awareness is one of the ways we do that. But it can't just stay there. So when we see awful realities like human trafficking or disease or oppression or misogyny or racism or on and on I could go of the different evils that are plagued in this world, we, the church, needs to be known as a people who when we see those things, we don't just read an article about it, though we do that. We think about how can I protect those who the world is seeking to trample on? How can we stand against and be, be known as a people wherever we are, good seems to pre be preserved? That's the weight and the calling that's been given to us. Now, if you think about this for a second, as an individual, you're gonna feel daunted by that reality. You're thinking, so I gotta solve all those problems? Like if you're thinking, okay, I need to go solve racism. Like you're like, okay, that's on me now? No, it's on us. Like no, when you read the Bible, don't read it simply as an individual. The commands of God are given to the people of God to obey, not just individuals. You cannot obey every command that God gives to his people. You can't be salt to the earth. You can only be one place at a time. It's when we all take up our stance in this, our role in this, and fight against evil together in various ways God's called us to. So we have to be people who preserve what is good and fight against what is evil, but also, just like salt, we bring out the good things that are already in the world. So not only do we preserve what's decaying, we bring out and we bring out flavor of what is already good. So along with all the horrors that you find in the world, God in his grace continues, continues to give. Not just he made the world, he's continually giving good gifts in his grace to Christians and non-Christians alike. He gives good gifts now to Christians and non-Christians alike. There is still real beauty and joy and love and meaning you can find in this world because God has placed it in it. And Christians should be the one where we see beauty or we see love, we see joy, we should be like salt that seasons that and brings it out to even taste even better, be even sweeter, be even more savory. So once again, how can we kind of flavor the world, so to speak. What does that mean? What does that look like? Once again, applications are numerous. Let me give you a really, really practical one. We should throw the best parties. Really practical. Christians should throw the best parties. Now, you hear that word party, I know we've corrupted that term, and if you're thinking of some rager in your mind, take that out of your categories, okay? You're like, oh, like last Saturday? Maybe, maybe not, tell me more about it, right? Like that's, what, that's what I mean. But we should be the people, because listen, the essence of a, I, gosh, I love, like my like, dream party is like 10 to like 15 people, no more than that. Once you go over that, parties are terrible. I'm just kidding, but that, that's my personality type. Like I love that dinner party sort of setting, 
And there's something about, I, we, I had dinner uh, the other night at one of our elders' houses, and it just was a reminder for me that this, like, the essence of what a party is, is, is godly. Like, what is the essence of what a party is trying to sell? It's celebrating with those you love with no agenda or anything to accomplish. That's a party. Getting together to celebrate together, to enjoy one another with nothing to accomplish. And all the achievers are like, but what are we gonna do there? Hang out. But what are we, are we gonna build something? Nope, just hang out. That's what a party is. And do you know that God actually throws parties? So there's a famous story, the, the prodigal son, and it's a story about a son who rejects his dad, takes all of his inheritance, abandons his father, spends all of his money, and not just spends all his money generally like on some bad investments, he spends all of his money on prostitutes and drinking. He comes to his senses, he realizes that all the shame and guilt, if he would just go back to his father, he'd be better as a hired hand with his father than living the life he's living. He runs back to his father, the father runs to meet him, and the father is represented by God in the story. Look at how he responds to his son who's come home. Luke 15, 22. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. They began to party. Best attire, best food, best friends, great time, right? You, you may not be a Christian in this room, you can amen that, right? We can all agree a party is something that is, in the, at essence, it's God's telling you something about himself through a party. And as Christians, we shouldn't throw these lame celebrations with muted joy and muted love, right? We shouldn't be people who are just thinking, these don't really matter, these are superfluous. Do you know what heaven is going to be? It's the marriage supper of the lamb. It's a dinner, hanging out, recounting old stories, enjoying company. Now, if, if in your mind, if in your way of throwing a party, because listen, there's the joyful way to do this, and then there's entering into being more like the world and throwing a party that kind of plays on all of your self-destructive uh, destructive tendencies. Like if your way of throwing a party, listen to this, if your way of throwing a party causes you to act in ways you wouldn't normally, exclude those who aren't like you, numb yourself to escape your pain or your boredom, uh, boredom, give yourself to others who haven't committed themselves to you with all their life and love, and then causes you to feel terrible the next day, I don't think you're doing it right. I just don't think you're doing it right. If your way of partying makes you hate your life the next day, maybe rethink it. You do it with any other thing in your life. If every time you did something, it made you feel terrible the next day, you'd probably stop. But don't get rid of, listen, Christians, don't get rid of parties. Don't get rid of the good part of it. But the way you can is when you're at a dinner party, be the one who's asking questions. Be the one who's including the person who's quiet. I, I, it's my favorite thing, and maybe that person hates me when I do it, but when the person's quiet, I'm like, hey, embarrassing story, you're up. They're like, oh, I hate Tyler. That's fine, that's fine. But I'm always found like, oh, because the best parties include people, not exclude them. So that's just one, I mean, I'm, I wanted to use that because all of us love those times and maybe your missional community or maybe the community of friends you have, maybe a way to, to love the, your friends who don't believe in Jesus is not to evangelize them, but to have a party with them. Maybe that's a way to do it. So we protect and promote what is good, but listen, salt is only good if you use it and it's only good if it stays salty. So it's only good if you use it. Like if, if you don't actually put salt on your food, it doesn't do its job. So that means we have to be in the world. We have to be people who are in every area of the world. We can't bless it from a distance. Now listen, I know that we'll struggle to live this out. Like we'll struggle to actually live this out with intentionality in our lives, but I have yet, okay, that's too strong. I have. It's been rare that I've met a Christian who right now in our generation of people who thinks we should withdraw from the world. Back, uh, see Bunker joke, right? Like there's not many people that I've met who are wired that way. Some are, some of you are thinking, we gotta get away from them, we gotta just, just bless them from a distance, say a, say a prayer for them but stay away. But for the most part, what is so great about what God has done in our generation is we, I think we, and I love particularly, about the University of Texas, 
I love how many Christians genuinely want to go follow Jesus in their area of study. I just love that University of Texas, for the most, when I was college pastor, for the most part, people didn't wanna go in to be a pastor, they wanted to go be a scientist and do it for the sake of Jesus. They wanted to be an artist, they wanted to write, they wanted to, to study, they wanted to do all sorts of things, and they wanted to do it in the world where people were. And I love that about what God has done in our city, and that's a good thing. But here's the problem. One of the aspects of the salt analogy and metaphor that I'm honestly concerned for us, I'm not just like a temporary concern, I'm concerned for us like going forward as a people, and larger than this in our church is as a young Christian sort of generation, because we love being in the world. But Jesus' warning in this is not about salt being in the world. It's about salt losing its saltiness. Look at verse 13 again. You are the salt of the earth, but here's his warning. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So he starts with this declaration, this promise, you're the salt of the earth. But then how he ends it with a warning. He says, if salt is no longer salty, then it's not good for anything. It might as well be thrown out and trampled on in the street. Now, once again, in our day, it's hard to understand, how can salt not be salty, right? How can salt not be salty? But once again, the salt they're using in that day and age, it actually was possible for it to lose some of its chemical elements that preserved and flavored food. So it was possible for something to look like salt and not have the quality of salt, to lose, listen, to lose what made it distinct, to lose what made it useful. The point he's making is you can only be helpful to the earth if you're distinct from it. Salt's only helpful to meat if it's not meat, if it's distinct from it, if it has all the chemical qualities and, and traits it needs to actually preserve good and to flavor and season. If you, listen, if you lose your distinction from those who don't believe in your love and in your character and in your thinking and in your ethics and in your behavior, then you can no longer really help the world. If you lose that, you can no longer really be helpful to the world. And this is where my concern for me and for you is genuine and sincere, because I'm not sure we believe that. I'm really not sure that we believe that. So once again, if you're a Christian in this room, I'm not sure if we see how important it is to still remain distinct from the world while we're in the world, not for the sake of just being holy, but for the sake of being helpful. For the sake of being helpful. Here's what I mean. I think so many of us, more than we'd like to admit, we, our current posture is a reaction to many Christians who've erred on the other side. So all of us have Christians we know or a caricature we have in our mind of those Christians who cannot relate to the world on any level. Those Christians who live in their religious bubble, they don't seem to have any sympathy, any empathy for those who don't believe what we believe. They don't seem to have any patience or understanding or understand the messiness of what it means to follow Jesus. They, they don't seem to have any sort of kindness to people who don't do what they're supposed to do immediately. They kind of perceive of themselves as always getting it, always understanding it. And so we kind of have this picture of what Christians are like and they don't have to know how to relate to people in the world at all. And so we kind of overreact and we think, oh, we're gonna be the most relatable, the most sort of cool, and we'll be able to help the world by agreeing with them. Like we've swung to the point that we're empathy, being relatable and agreeing with the world and now seems like the only way you could truly love somebody. That's what's happened. That's where we're at. The claim, the claim is that, the, the, that love begins and ends. It's really important you hear me say that. Begins and ends with accepting people and that's it. That's, the, that's what we all live in right now. That all love is, is accepting someone right where they are. But what is Jesus' warning? His warning is not, you can be too much in the world. It's not his warning. His warning is, you can get there and then lose your saltiness, lose what makes you distinct from the world, and then no longer be of any use. Now, listen, his point, his point, if you're beginning to check out a little bit, listen. His point is that love for the world is never less than empathy, 
never less than relating, never less than accepting people where they are. Listen, hear me clearly. We need to grow in empathy. We need to really grow in listening. I really hope as a church with your non-Christian friends and people in this world don't believe what we believe, you'd ask more questions and you'd listen more fervently before you speak with some sort of authority in their life. Because it's really godly and biblical to meet people where they are. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Do you rejoice because you're happy? No, because they are. Do you cry because you're sad? No, but because they are. What are you doing? You're matching them. You're meeting people where they are. That's a good thing. Love always starts with empathy. It starts with understanding. It starts with listening. But it's not the totality of love. Because to truly protect and promote what is good, we need to help people and societies actually change. And to help somebody change, you need to be different enough from them to see a way forward. Because if you aren't at all different, then how are you ever gonna help them change in their lives as well? To, To be salt is to meet people in the evil and the brokenness and the pain and hurting of this world, to meet them where they are, but then help them see and encourage them and persuade them and and really importantly, model for them what does it mean to actually follow Jesus in the midst of it. So really hard right turn here. You ever been rock climbing before? Really hard right turn. Rock climbing in a cave before? So I don't have what you would call a rock climbing body type, but I've gone a couple times. Um, Listen, every body type has strengths and weaknesses. Rock climbing, if my life depended on it, I'd be dead. That's how that would work, okay? Not built for it. But there was one time in college, me and some buddies of mine, we were actually at Enchanted Rock in Fredericksburg. And we went there, just like 10 or 15 of us, and we went into this cave. And we'd been in this cave for some time, 10 of us, and we come to this point, we've been there for like 45 minutes, kind of going through and traversing through it. It's pitch black, we have, we don't have iPhones, we're just, so one person has a flashlight. And we come to this place, we've been there, there's like 10 of us, so we're all like, like crammed in, all in a line. We get to this place where this is really narrow way forward. And none of us really know what to do. This one guy has done this before, and he knows the way out is actually through this, this little narrow opening. You get through, and then you shimmy your way up 10 feet, and you come out of the top of the cave. And he's like, that's what we gotta do. And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm ever doing that, right? I'll die in this cave, that's where I'm at. And so of course, we all have that one friend who's like, no fear, I got it, right? So this one guy goes, here, I I know how to do it, I'll do it for everybody so you can trust me. So he gets through, he shimmies his way up, we hear him kind of grunting or whatever, and then we hear him shout, it worked, okay? But in my mind, I'm thinking, this dude is 5'6", 135, okay? I'm gonna die in this cave. Like if, if he got through there, that's great. But there's no way I'm fitting through there and all a big guy needs is to get stuck in a cave and get rescued by firefighters, okay? That's all that I need, okay? So I'm not doing that. And so I'm, I'm, and I'm a pretty stubborn person. I'm just kinda like, I guess I'm going back. I don't know what to do. And everyone's kinda going through, but every, once again, everyone else is like, oh, he's 5'8", 115. Like we're getting skinnier somehow, right? So they're all getting through. But there's a guy who's kind of similar body type to me and he's like, hey, let me go and let me try. So he goes through and he gets out and he shimmies his way up and he does it. And that's what I, I needed someone, right? I needed someone who was like me, right? Similar body type, similar frame. I needed him to go before me and, sh- and show me it's actually possible, it's reasonable to take the risk that I'm terrified to take, right? He had to be like me and yet different to help me out of the cave. Now imagine, imagine if all he had given me was empathy. So imagine if I'm in that cave, I'm freaking out, I'm gonna die here, and then everyone's gone, just me and this one guy left, and he kinda comes beside me and goes, hey, Tyler, scared, huh? I'm like, real scared. (laughs) He's like, dude, I've been scared too. It's been really hard for me. I love you, man. Gives me a hug, head on my shoulder, he's like, for you, man. I'm like, that's cool, thanks. Can you help me out of this cave? He's like, no, we're gonna die in here. I'm like, okay, okay. (laughs) I'm not really, I'm helped, thank you for the love. I'd like to get out, right? If all he does is empathize with me, but he can't show me there's an actual way forward, it will be good for a moment, but then I'm gonna be left, but I'm still stuck here. 
And can I tell you how many Christians in this room, you think that what the world needs is for you to always just simply empathize, relate, and understand. It's true. But then you have to show them, but is there a different way for us to do this? Is there a way forward? We have to be a people who can show them there actually is a better way to live your life. If you lose the values and the ethics and the perspective of the kingdom of God, if you don't believe in actual grace, you'll never be able to help them forward. And sometimes, listen, sometimes being associated and aligned with the kingdom of God will put you at odds with a person who doesn't believe what we believe. And you'll think, well, to be salt is to always disagree with them. That's actually not what Jesus is saying. He's saying to be salt is to even, in a loving way, press on the di- disagreement, as so long as you're disagreeing with Jesus, not with me, and encourage them, plead with them to trust God's word over our word. So you have to be a Christian. You have to be relating to people, but you also have to be striving towards something different. So listen, you should know and you do know what it's like to be lonely. Every study is saying every person in this room is more lonely than than people were 30 years ago. Like the average number of friends that we have has been cut in half in the last 25 years. One of the, the CDC just recently said one of the highest causes of death is loneliness. So everyone in here knows what it's like to be lonely. But if you're a Christian and you're just staying in that loneliness and you're not striving to belong to the people and family of God, then you can't help them out of it. But if we're, if we're being faithful, we can go, hey, I know what it's like to be lonely. And I know what, how, insecure, how insecure you can be to start all over and make new friends. Let me show you how I'm doing it, come with me. Right? All of us know what it's like to have sexual shame and failure and guilt and hurt. Oh, every single one of us has that. So we can be different and strive and say, I know what it's like to have that. Here's the way self-control and love is better than the things I was going to. All of us know what it's like to be anxious. So we can strive forward and say, I know what it's like to be anxious. I'm striving forward to show you what God's sovereignty in all things does for my confidence level in my circumstances. Right, we relate to where people are, but then we strive forward. Because if we don't strive forward, we won't actually be helpful to other people. We'll just be in the cave with them with no real way out. And this is why, listen, this is why so many of us are not compelling to our Christian friends, I mean to our non-Christian friends. Here's why we're not winsome, is because we're not doing the things we're telling them they should do. We're not pursuing the things that we talk about are great. So what happens in the Christian faith, you kind of have one of two ways if you're trying to, be, if you're trying to talk about what God's word says, either become a, a hypocrite or a coward. Be, if you're not gonna obey, you're either gonna be a hypocrite or a coward. You're gonna be a hypocrite and tell people to do things that you yourself are not doing. Hey, yeah, crawl through that little crevice and shimmy up. I'm, it's great, I've done it 100 times, but you never actually have done it. Or to be a coward and to say, you know what, you're probably right, Jesus is probably wrong, let's just stay here. For you to actually help people and be the salt, you're gonna have to to venture for yourself and proactively follow Jesus and say, I know it was scary, but it was worth it. It was worth it. I didn't believe in grace and it's always been there for me. I didn't believe I could be forgiven, but every time I get around the scriptures and I read them for myself, I see God's gracious and kind. That's what it means to be salt, to persuade, encourage, and model the way forward. Not proclaim and declare. It's one of the things that we're doing right now It's not working, telling people what they should do. Maybe tell them how Jesus is changing your life. Maybe try to persuade them instead of yell at them. Maybe model for them instead of saying things that you're not really doing. So don't talk about loving the poor if you're not. Don't talk about being generous if you're not. When you taste and see for yourself, you'll be salty as a Christian. So here's the last question. How do you stay salty as a Christian? And not like mean. Like how how do you stay salty in a godly way? I I know how to say salty in an ungodly way for sure. How do you stay salty as a Christian? How do you stay in the world yet distinct from the world? Very simply, listen, you must, must proactively and constantly stay close to what makes you salty in the first place. The only way to stay salty is to stay near the the source of what makes you distinct. And it's the most churchy answer in the world. You stay near Jesus. 
The only way to stay salty is to stay near Jesus himself. Now, I know that sounds cliche and churchy, but let me explain. The salt of the earth analogy is exceedingly massive and broad and incredibly complicated. Here's what I found in life. In one situation, there is something you can do as a Christian that is actually godly and blesses and loves the person in the situation. And then you find yourself in a totally different situation and that same behavior is actually ungodly and not caring and not kind for them. Because life is complicated. So how in the world are you gonna be able to distinguish when, when should I do this and when should I do that in the midst of stories of every person in this room has a story different than yours. The only way to have any wisdom is to stay near the one who is truly salt of the earth. How are you gonna balance truth and love? How are you gonna balance mercy and justice? How are you gonna balance submission and resistance? You stay around who is truly the salt of the earth. See, Jesus is calling you and us salt of the earth, why? Because that's who he is. He came to bless the world, how? Being like you and yet different from you. That's the gospel. He came to be like you and yet different from you. This is what Christmas celebrates every year. The fact that God himself, who is totally different than us, becomes a baby to come and save us, to be like you, yet different. So he was born like you, but he was born of a virgin, different. He was tempted like you, but he never sinned like you. He had lost like you, but he never wavered in faith like you. He's like you, yet he's different. And then we, listen, we needed a savior who was kind enough, gentle enough, patient enough to actually feel what we feel. We needed a savior who didn't just look at us with, with frustration that we weren't stronger, but who wrapped himself in your story and knew what it was like to be you. But we also needed a savior who hadn't failed like us, who wasn't blind to our self-destructive tendencies like us, who wasn't plagued by guilt and fear like us, who wasn't driven by our own sense of woundedness and desperation. We needed Jesus. Jesus, you have to show me what true blessing and love looks like. He needed to be the salt of the earth before we ever could be. That's what Hebrews 2 says. Hebrews 2, 17 through 18 describes what it means for him to be salt. It says, Therefore he, talking about Jesus, had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect. Why? So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Because he's gone through what you've gone through and yet was perfect, he can help you. He can simultaneously relate to the temptation and simultaneously know sin never gives you what it promises because righteousness always gave him what it promised. Do you realize there's nothing like Christianity, that our source for loving people is never rooted in us or in them, it's always rooted in how Jesus loved us? That's so unique. Everything else is telling you the reason you love other people is because you're so loving or they're so deserving of it, but when you live your life, you know what you realize? I'm not that loving. You know what you realize? Not every person always deserves the thing you think they should be given. And the Christian ethic is so unique because what fuels us is not that anyone deserves anything. It's that Jesus consistently loves me that way. That he became like me yet different than me so I could be different. So the only way you can be salt is by this constant sort of vibrant relationship with them. If you want to be salt and never talk to them, you'll hate following Jesus. It'll feel too weighty. But when you follow him daily, when you go to the scriptures daily and you hear from him, when you depend on him moment by moment through prayer, when you go to him and confess your sin and repent of what you've done and receive grace and mercy afresh, you try to order your whole life around him, when you get around who's salty, you'll begin to be like him. I love that the call for you to be salt of the earth forces you to be close to Jesus. The only way to do it is to be around him. And how are you around him? through his word, through his people, through his mission, by receiving mercy consistently. Do you understand how amazing he is? Do you understand he's not calling you to do anything he hasn't already done? 
I love that about Jesus, that every time he calls you to do anything, he's only saying, walk where I've walked, be kind where I've been kind, be bold where I've been bold. And when we do that, we will actually live out our purpose for being salt. We'll live out our purpose of preserving good, promoting good. And our city, our friends, our family members, they can see, man, the kingdom of God is strong enough to not wither in the face of evil. The kingdom of God is strong enough to throw even better parties than we could imagine. The kingdom of God is strong enough to have grace for failures like me. And we get to go, yeah, yeah. There's a way out of this cave. And I'm only showing you the way that Jesus already showed us. So we can't be proud about it. We can just be happy, beloved, blessed people in the kingdom of God, showing the world God really intends to do good and to bless. Let's pray together. Father, what a call for us. What a challenge to us. For so many of us, God, who think in our heart of hearts we could never be used, in our heart of hearts we wanna settle for little lives with little meaning, you, Jesus, you just keep calling us to yourself and then you have all these plans for us and all these dreams for us and all this vision for us. And every time we fail and every time we, we feel like we're disqualified and every time we feel like there's no way this situation could be used by you for any good, over time, you keep showing yourself faithful and true and trustworthy. God, would you save us from being a church of people who have never actually taken the risk, even in small ways, of obeying you? Obeying you in ways that don't come natural to us, obeying you in ways we didn't foresee, but yet obeying you in the small daily steps of being near you. And that when we see evil in this world in all of its forms and all of its facets, we'd pray and ask you to give us wisdom. And God, sometimes being salt is praying for those who are going through difficult times because we don't know what to do. When we see famines in Yemen and we don't know what to do, we don't know how to help, God, sometimes it's just begging you to be merciful and kind and save those children. When we see power systems corrupt and abusive and we, we don't know what we could do, we pray and we ask, but then God, we have situations at work or at home and we get to be the one to be kind. We wanna lash out and yet we realize, Jesus, you loved us when we were a pain. God, give us higher standards, not because we're so good, because God, you're so gracious. I want this city, God, to see, and all of our non-Christian friends to see, we are, we're not selling them. We're not selling a product here. We're showing them the way of blessing and love and life. And Jesus, it's found in you and you alone. So show us the way. Show me the way. From the small steps to the big steps of what that means, God, show us the way and give us faith that says, even in the most difficult, confusing time, I'm in. I'm with you because every time I've said no, Jesus, you've still been with me. God, even now, bring people to mind, bring causes to mind that we need to be salt. Forgive us for the ways we neglect this calling for lesser things. And even during Christmas, God, help us be a people who don't settle for nostalgia, but we look to serve whether it's at home or in this city, help us be people who look to serve. God, I love you because you are so much better than everything else. And I want the world, we want the world to see that with us. Jesus, get the glory you deserve. We pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen, church, let's stand. Let's sing together.